All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks again for uh, turning out uh, for these, uh, these talks and for the food and the fellowship. So in my lecture this evening, I want to, uh, my, my ambitions are, are pretty low. I mainly just want to revisit with you all uh, a critically important and enormously influential concept in the history of political philosophy, and that is the social contract theory of the 17th century British philosopher John Locke. And I'm interested in Locke's theory of the social contract because I believe it provides one of the clearest and most helpful ways of thinking about the nature and origin of political society and political power. Why do we form political societies and civil governments? And what is it that we ought, and equally importantly, what is it that we ought not to expect from civil government? Locke's theory of the social contract represents one of the most important and cogent answers, I believe, to these questions on offer. One that also exercised an enormous influence over the American revolutionaries and founders of our own system of government. If there was a title for being the philosopher of the American founding, few, if any, thinkers could with greater justice lay claim to that title than John Locke. Far from his ideas being of mere historical interest, however, Locke sets forth universal principles that I believe we neglect or forget to the great peril of our own liberty and social well-being. Well, before we begin, uh, I want to make uh, this qualification, this lecture commending Locke's theory of the social contract. And I say social contract, we're going to be especially focusing on his, his theory of the, the state of nature this evening and the time that we have. But in commending Locke's theory of the social contract, it should not be taken as a blanket endorsement of everything Locke believed. On the contrary, there are not only many aspects of Locke's ethics, his anthropology, uh, his epistemology, his metaphysics, his cosmology, and even his theology that I would either quibble with or would straight up uh, reject. Uh, and there are even certain elements of his political philosophy and his teaching on the social contract that I would disagree with as well. Uh, my purpose in this lecture accordingly is not to endorse everything in Locke's political philosophy as a whole, but merely to commend some features of Locke's social contract theory that I think provide a useful and even necessary starting point for our own political thinking and discussions. Well, Locke's theory of the social contract appears in his famous little second treatise on government. Uh, how many of you have read this before? Okay. Those of you who have taken my class, good. <laughs> Glad. <laughs> Glad. Okay. Uh, and some others. All right. Well, um, hopefully uh, uh, those of you who haven't read it, and even if you have read it, uh, it bears revisiting. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those books you should just come back to uh, every couple of years. Um, Locke published his second treatise the year following England's glorious revolution in 1688, when King James II was forced to flee England and Parliament replaced him on the throne with his daughter Mary and her husband William, William and Mary. Part of Locke's purpose in his treatise, accordingly, was to provide a philosophical justification for the revolution. There's some debate among scholars whether it was actually written before or after the revolution, but at least in publishing it, um, his purpose um, oh, and actually, interesting, in entire, throughout his entire life, Locke never uh, owned up to, to having uh, written it. Um, but um, he published it, uh, part of his purpose in publishing it was to provide a philosophical justification for the revolution, doing so by arguing that all legitimate political authority has its source in the consent of the people. The deposing of one political ruler, in this case James II, and his replacement with another, William and Mary, was justified for no other reason than because that's what the people wanted. Those were the rulers the people chose. Locke opens the second treatise by constructing an elegantly simple yet powerful political myth. A political myth. By calling it a myth, I don't mean to say that it is false. On the contrary, I think it is remarkably true. But it is a myth in the sense that Locke sets out to tell a deliberately idealized origin story of where political society and political power come from and why. And what Locke essentially asks us to do is to try to imagine what society is or would be like without civil government. If you want to understand what civil government is, then you need to understand what its unique contribution to society is. And to do that, you need to have some ability to abstract, 
civil government away from society and, and see what you're left with in the end. And when you have made that act of mentally imagining away civil government, what you are left with um, are human beings existing in a condition that Locke called the state of nature. The state of nature. Now, the state of nature, again, it's humankind understood apart from or logically, if not chronologically, prior to the addition or the advent of civil government. By state of nature, Locke does not mean a, a primitive or barbaric or uncivilized or pre-civilized or pre-social state, but simply human life and all of its wide-ranging complexity, diversity, but just with civil government just sort of factored out. Now, before considering what Locke has to say about this state of nature, let me address uh, a common objection to the very idea, the, the very uh, thesis that you can consider man in a pre-political condition at all. This is a common objection uh, to Locke's whole exercise. If man, after all, and as many uh, people would maintain, if man is by nature a political animal, then one cannot abstract away political society or civil government without radically altering the very nature of the thing you're trying to study. The very concept of a pre-political or depoliticized state of nature on this objection would not only be an abstraction, but a falsifying fiction. Take away political society and civil government that are thought to be necessary to man's very being, and you are left with precisely nothing. Well, to this objection, I would reply that I don't think Locke is actually being all that original here. He's in fact engaging, I think, in a mental exercise or thought experiment that really lies at the heart of the entire tradition of political uh, philosophical reflection in the West. Um, and that is, if we want to understand political society and political authority, we need to explain man's political motives in terms of more fundamental pre-political impulses. Uh, just take the book of Genesis, for example. It's notable that the Lord God does not create man in community, much less in political community. Um, but instead, the Lord God, uh, he creates man alone, requiring him to become aware for himself of the absence the absence of and yet his need for a companion suitable to him. So a kind of um, unnatural state given where Adam's going and yet the Lord creates him alone. In Plato's Republic, Socrates says that if we want to understand what justice is in the city, then we need to be able to observe the city coming into being. So the whole discussion of the ideal city in the Republic actually begins in a kind of pre-political state of nature. Aristotle, likewise, begins his politics by stating that if we are to understand the political community, then we need to not only analyze it into its simpler pre-political parts, but we also need to be able to see how the political community develops organically from those more elemental parts. Thus, he begins with individuals forming households, households which in turn form villages, and villages which finally coalesce into political communities, the, the polis, the city-state. St. Augustine, for his part, didn't think that civil government existed at all prior to the fall. On, more, on that, uh, see an earlier uh, Buchanan lecture. Um, but in holding this view, Augustine implies that man, while a social creature by nature, is not necessarily a political animal by nature. As for St. Thomas Aquinas, who did believe that man was political by nature and that consequently there would have been civil government before the fall, even he found it helpful to begin his account of man's political nature by laying bare, bare those motives which drive men into society in the first place and why they find it necessary to organize those societies in a specifically political manner. Aquinas' political thought uh, arguably receives its fullest articulation uh, in the work of the late 16th, early 17th century Catholic theologian Francisco Suarez, in whom we find many of Locke's own ideas, including the state of nature and social contract theory, in seed form. Um, on the Protestant side of things, um, we also find an early version of Locke's theory of the state of nature and social contract theory in Samuel Rutherford, who's a, uh, one of the Westminster divines and author of Lex Rex. So when Locke begins his second treatise by asking us to imagine man in a pre-political state of nature, I don't really think he's doing anything all that new. What I think he's doing, rather, is he's just very conscious and self-aware of what he's doing, and as a consequence, I, I, I do think he's in some ways better at it than some, many of his forebears. So how does Locke describe this hypothetical state of nature? 
is first, first and foremost a state of freedom. Men are free to act and use their own possess, possessions how they see fit, so long as those actions don't interfere with the free actions of others, uh, the free actions of others and how others use their property. Uh, and we see here that private property is itself something that Locke believes exists in a state of nature. It's something that men possess as a matter of pre-political natural right. We create governments to protect property rights. Pre property rights exist prior to government itself. In addition to the state of nature being a state of freedom, it is also a state of equality. Equality for Locke, where no one is naturally subordinate to or subject to the rule of others. Now, this is also very important to understand. It's another point in which Locke sometimes gets criticized. Locke is no egalitarian. He thinks that men are uh, unequal to each other in virtually every other respect. Um, he talks about age, virtue, merit, birth, alliances, and all sorts of other benefits. Men are not equal to each other. In fact, about the only respect in which they are equal to each other in the state of nature is politically. Um, no man by nature is a ruler over anyone else. Um, so here again, Locke is not actually being all that novel, but is merely echoing the views of other such eminent thinkers as Suarez, Rutherford, and uh, Richard Hooker, amongst others. And while there's no government and hence no human law in the state of nature, the state of nature is a place of moral, natural law. Um, now, I think Locke's account of natural law does leave something to be desired, but he does have an account of natural law, and it's there in, in the state of nature. One of the moral laws in the state of nature uh, we've already mentioned, men for all their freedom may not use their freedom to violate the freedom of others. Another fundamental moral law in the state of nature for Locke is a vari variation on the golden rule. In the state of nature, a man knows that he cannot expect other men to do him good unless he is willing to do them good in return. This is important to note because Locke is often accused of making man in the state of nature into this fabled homo economicus, someone who crassly pursues his own self-interest with little or to no regard for others. Um, and as I say, one, of, one moral law uh, Locke emphasizes a principle of loving one's neighbor. Um, if I want others to give something to me or someone else, what is it that I'm willing to give them in return? Uh, beyond this, uh, Locke characterizes the state of nature um, as one that at least ought to be marked by peace, goodwill, mutual assistance, and preservation uh, of oneself and others. Um, even in the state of nature, one must not harm others in their life, health, liberty, or possessions. I mentioned this earlier. Um, and it's notable that the justification he gives for this law not to, not to aggress, not to violate the rights of others, is expressly theological. It's, uh, every, every human being is the property of God and must be respected as such. We belong to God. Man in the state of nature is not an isolated individual, but has a social nature with social responsibilities, including the duty to preserve the peace and life of others so far as is possible. In the state of nature, moreover, men are able to exchange with each other and make promises and contracts with each other, and they have the moral duty to keep those contracts. To the objection that such a state of nature is a fiction that has never existed, Locke points out that actually precisely this condition that he's just described exists among and between every independent political community uh, existing today. They are in a state of nature with respect to each other. Another perhaps more surprising natural right that man has in the state of nature is the right to punish others if they commit acts of aggression against either oneself or others. Um, another idea we see in figures like Rutherford. Even in the state of nature, however, this natural right to punish wrongdoers must itself, Locke says, be exercised with due proportion, lest the avenger himself then become guilty of violating somebody else's rights and thus become liable to the punishment of someone else. So you can punish others in the state of nature if they, if they commit rights violations, but in punishing them, you have to make sure you yourself don't become a rights violator, then somebody else can come in and punish you. In the state of nature, therefore, individuals or entire groups can also work together to bring an offender to justice. 
Well, if the state of nature is as social, economic, moral, and just as Locke says it at least potentially is able to be, why would we ever choose to leave it by creating political societies? Locke's answer, in a word, is it's inconvenient. Inconveniences. As much as the state of nature has going for it, it is, by its very nature, still marked with certain unavoidable inconveniences. The essential problem with the state of nature is that because there is no established political authority, there is no established law or impartial judges or an agency, a publicly accountable agency capable of enforcing those laws. Um, They don't exist to remedy the situation when men commit wrongs against each other. Instead, each man having the natural right to punish offenders is free to operate as a judge in his own case thus making justice and the protection of rights insecure and undependable. It is in order to rectify these legal, judicial, and executive deficiencies of the state of nature, finally, that men choose to leave their condition of natural liberty of the state of nature and enter into political society with each other and to form governments that are better able to provide protection and justice. Political society is thus created when there is established there's established a system of government that is able to protect the persons and properties and property of its members this happens when the individual members of a community then voluntarily give up certain of their natural rights and exchanging them for uh, the greater protection of their remaining rights within civil society and it is this act of consenting to a form of uh, a, a distinct political body ruled by civil government that constitutes the social contract. So this is a brief summary then that I've given of John Locke's social contract there, at least the the kind of state of nature myth leading up to it. Um, And while there are places where I think one can and perhaps even should quibble with Locke's account, the basic outline of his account I think seems not only sound but um, um, uh, quite valuable. Men are by nature free and not subject to authorities um, over each other. Virtually every single subject-ruler relationship in human history might, under different circumstances, have been reversed, where the ruler had turned out to be the subject and the subject the ruler. The relationship of political authority, accordingly, is something that human beings create, even if there's a sense in which it is natural, at least in our fallen world, for them to create this relationship. As a human creation, any particular relationship of political authority and obligation is a given of neither nature nor of divine decree, but is brought about by deliberate, purposeful human action, which is to say it is something chosen or consented to. If it was not consented to, then to assert political rule over someone who is otherwise, by nature, one's political equal and who is himself innocent of any wrongdoing, It is to ground one's political authority not in right, but in might. Not in justice, but in superior violent power. One conclusion, then, I want to suggest that there's something fundamentally correct and even inevitable to how Locke goes about explaining and justifying political authority. I think he misses some things in places, but the story he has to tell of how and why we go from a state of nature to a state of political society is a helpful and necessary one, one capable of shedding much light on our own political relations today. We need to get better at Locke's kind of political myth-making because the myth he's telling is a fundamentally true one. So let me end with some questions. Um, Have you, Locke would ask, have us ask ourselves, have you consented to your government? If so, when did they ask you for your consent and when did you give it? If your government hasn't asked you for your consent, why do you think that is? Would it be good for the integrity of governments if they had to get our explicit consent before asserting their right to direct us in matters where we weren't guilty of some other crime? But suppose now you were given the uncoerced choice to consent to our current government. Would you choose it? Would you consent to it? I suppose it might depend on what the options were and what they would do to you uh, if you refused. But again, if it's uncoerced and they came to you and uh, with the U.S. Constitution, let's say, and asked you to sign it, would you? Um, Would you consent? And if you wouldn't, what does that suggest to you about the legitimacy of your government? 
And since it also seems to be a topic on many people's minds at the moment, I thought I'd end with a brief uh, application to Locke, of Locke's social contract theory to the question of Christian nationalism. This is something Jeremy's going to be talking about at the end in his talk. Um, every Christian should want a Christian government. I think that should go without saying. Every Christian should want a Christian government. The only question we should be debating is what a Christian government looks like. For the Christian nationalist, as I understand him, a Christian government is a government that actively seeks to promote through coercive law, the values, culture, religious beliefs, and practices, and ethnic identity of the Christians who happen to be, happen to be in power in that particular nation. And which likewise, a, a Christian nation is one that suppresses by coercive law those things that are perceived as rivals or obstacles to the prevailing Christian values, culture, religion, and identity. For Locke and the Lockean tradition, however, as important as these things may be, and there's nothing in Locke to suggest that those things aren't important, as far as I'm aware. As important as these things may be, these are not the reasons why we form political society and civil governments, nor would it be rational or right for us to do so, to, to found governments on those principles, to protect, promote those kinds of things. What we want civil government for, rather, according to Locke, is so that even people of otherwise different values, cultures, religions, and ethnicities, might nevertheless live together in peace at least so long as they are willing to agree on certain basic ground rules of respecting each other's natural rights. Where those ground rules come from, and whether they can in fact be sustained for long apart from a robust Christian society and culture, these are all very good and important questions whose implications we are seeing, at least in part, played out before us in our own time. None of this, however, I think represents any kind of refutation of Locke's theory of the social contract is the basis of a civil government whose sole purpose is to protect individuals and their property from acts of aggression. If we want a sound political philosophy that will help us address the social ills of our day, I think John Locke's theory of the social contract is very much worth another try. Thank you.